So I want to spend some time again reflecting on the second of what the Buddha calls liberating understandings. The understanding of dukkha. It's a word many of you will be familiar with, but many of you may not be, and so I'll go into it in a moment. But this again is both a personal and a universal story. But the strands of dukkha run through all of our lives, and none of us are exempt. So we would have put it in the formula, all conditioned phenomena are dukkha. It's not a Buddhist story. This is a very human story. But it's so important for us to be so clear about what dukkha means. When the Buddha says, I teach only one thing, that there is dukkha and there is an end of dukkha, and dukkha is to be understood. Now, the very worst translation of dukkha is suffering. Okay? <laughs> That is the absolute worst translation, <laughs> and you hear it too much. <laughs> um, and then it sounds really grim and depressing, you know, when I, when I say, when I'm playing with my baby granddaughter, you know, and she's chortling away, and I'm thinking, this is really suffering. <laughs> you know, it's not suffering, it's joyful, you know. We have moments indeed in our lives when we do suffer. You know, when there's pain in the heart, pain in the mind, pain in the body, pain in events in our lives, we do have moments in our lives when there is suffering, and then that changes and can change into something else, where we have moments of joyfulness, moments of happiness, moments of delight, moments of celebration. So suffering is the absolute worst translation. And it doesn't ring true in our experience. So, let's think about what the Buddha meant by dukkha. First of all, there's dukkha dukkha, the pain of pain. You know? Sometimes life just hurts, doesn't it? You know, the body's ill, the body's in pain. You know, there's aging, it's not fun. Uh, well, maybe it's fun for some of you. Um, there's aging, there's sickness, there's dying. You know, none of us are exempt. This is dukkha dukkha, the pain of pain. Huh? Then there's anicca dukkha, huh? that again we've spoken about. None of us are exempt. The, the, the implications of change and impermanence, you know, that sometimes this is sad, yeah. Sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's heartbreaking. It's not intended to be emotionally neutral. And it is true that nothing is exempt from change. Then there's Viparanami Dukkha, which is the Dukkha that is born of the instability of conditions. We can't get up this morning, decide the sun will shine. You know, conditions come together in a certain form and they have certain outcomes. You know? The instability, we stand on, on, on shifting sands in our life. And I think we know this, we know this. My favorite translation of this word dukkha at the moment is vulnerability. You know? We are vulnerable, as human beings we're vulnerable to aging, sickness, death, to pain. As human beings, we're vulnerable to the impact of change. We are vulnerable to the uncertainty of living on shifting sands. None of us are exempt. This is our, our vulnerability to be embraced, to be understood. And then there is the last dimension of dukkha, which is sankhata dukkha, the dukkha of patterning. And this domain of dukkha describes the whole realm of argument that we have with the unarguables. You know, our reactivity, our aversion, our wanting, our not wanting, our denial, our impatience, our frustration, our blame, our guilt. This is all sankata dukkha, the dukkha of patterning. And when the Buddha says, I teach just one thing, there's dukkha and there's an end of dukkha. 
he wasn't prescribing some recipe for immortality or stability or exemptions. It is this last domain of dukkha that can end, and this is in our hands. Certainly there is distress in the world of aging, sickness and death. There can be distress in the world of change and uncertainty, but the greatest distress lies in our reactivity. And this is what really is in our hands. I think Sankhata Dukkha describes the confused relationship that we form with the first domains of Dukkha. Our emotional and psychological habits, and many of you, particularly any of you in the mindfulness, secular mindfulness world, really knows this story of the two darts. Does anybody not know the story of the two darts? Right, it's coming. <laughs> because it is such a teaching story that if you were shot, well, with an arrow, actually. If you were shot with an arrow, you will experience pain. We would all experience pain. But when we go into the story of being shot with the arrow, you know, who shot it, why did they do it, what's it made of, you know, what did I do to deserve this, we are in the realm of being shot by a second arrow. And it's that second arrow that we're really learning to calm and to release. Sankata Dukkha describes the volitional tendencies and patterns that arise in the moment that create and recreate distress. You know, certainly from the perspective of the Buddhist teaching, distress is not a constant. It is something that is created and recreated out of confusion and out of reactivity. And it's not a terminal condition. Sankata Dukkha, I want to give you a sense of the landscape of Sankata Dukkha because this is the one we're really invited to understand. Sankata Dukkha begins with the big ones, the patterns of greed, the patterns of hatred or ill will, and the patterns of confusion. And these have big families, don't they? Yeah, they have huge families. Um, they would include jealousy, envy, craving for becoming, sensual craving, doubt, um, speculative views. They would include the, the hindrance factors, the restlessness, the worry, the, the uh, aversion, the agitation, um, the dullness, the doubt. All of this is Sankhata Dukkha. And Sankata Dukkha would include clinging. It is, essentially includes all of the unskillful reactive patterns that are suffering in themselves and actually create and recreate suffering. There's a world of volitional impulses. Now, I think we need to be very careful with this, this word volition, volitional. Because when we hear volitional, we think, well, this is something very conscious or, in or intentional. But volitions are not always conscious or in intentional. This is, volitions move us. This is what moves our speech, moves our body, yeah? moves our thinking. Volition is like the, the petrol in a car. It what, it's what gets us moving. And sometimes it's skillful, and sometimes it's not. And I think it's fairly easy to identify when we are really held in the grip of unconscious or unskillful volitions because we struggle, you know, and, and we feel distressed, and sometimes we suffer. And it's even greater suffering, I think, when there's just enough mindfulness in place to know what we're doing. Yeah. It's even a bigger, it, uh, it's a whole third arrow. <laughs> yes, I've been shot with the second arrow and I'm really reactive and I know I'm being really reactive. It makes it even worse, you know. We're a little unconscious, more unconsciousness in those moments sounds like a good deal. You know? um, we can feel quite powerless, I think, between the, before the force of these habits. 
and it's difficult. Um, it's a difficult place in practice, I think, when we know what we're doing and we do it anyway. I think it's a really, really challenging place in practice. And you know, the bad, well, the bad news is it can go on for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, that we know what we're doing and we're doing it any, we're doing it anyway. <laughs> it can be very frustrating. It can be very despairing. It can make us feel rather helpless. Um, but this is actually our classroom. This is our classroom. That we, we, we more and more contemplate what dukkha is. We more and more contemplate what brings us out of distress. And we see more and more move into the terri- territory of conscious intentionality, of what we are cultivating in those classrooms, of aversion, of resistance, of fear. What are we cultivating in those classrooms? And you know, you know, the path of the teaching officer so much. You know, this is a classroom where we cultivate kindness. It's a cultivate classroom where we cultivate mindfulness, where we cultivate investigation, where we cultivate patience, where we cultivate compassion. You know, this is a curriculum. There is no other curriculum or classroom. Patterns, sankharas or sankata shape our world of experience. As the Buddha put it, all experience is led by mind, made by mind, shaped by mind. With our thoughts, our volitional impulses, we create our world. All that we are arises with our volitional impulses. I think understanding this process of patterning it's a present moment experience rooted in mindfulness and investigation. I'll give you an example. Recently, I was teaching in, in, at a center in the Netherlands, in Holland, and there's a lot of birds. There's a lot of birds around. But in the hall, there, there was a sound. In the meditation room, there was a sound. And a number of people came to me to complain about the sound, you know, somebody is snoring. <laughs> somebody is snoring, and you know, I, it seemed I needed to do something about it. You know, <laughs> somebody is snoring in the hall. I said, okay, well, we'll listen. And and you know, so the perception was there, the patterns were there of reactivity. You know, this shouldn't be happening. Moving into the body, moving into speech, moving into a sense of creating this other who was really intrusive. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen more deeply. Let's all listen a little bit more deeply. It was the sound of a distant woodpecker. <laughs> And you could see the moment that that registered, that it wasn't a person snoring, that it was a woodpecker tapping on a tree in the distance. All of the patterns dissolved in a moment. You know? Oh, isn't that lovely? There's a woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that terrible? So like, oh, isn't that lovely? So I mean, yeah. <laughs> We really see how much we need to question, don't we? How much we need to question our, our perceptions. Because if we're not questioning our perceptions, our reactions aren't going to change. Hmm? How much we just keep need to be probing. We're not invited to do a kind of archaeological dig around patterns. You know, where did this come from? Why is it here? Um, but to see the shaping, to see the shaping, you know, and isn't this happening every moment in our lives? You know, the shaping. And how many choices do we feel we have? You know, they, I, some of you heard me mention, you know, I, I live in, the, you know, Totnes, you know, lovely a town in the countryside, you know, it's surrounded by green space, you know, very friendly people, very amiable people, lovely place to live. I feel very privileged and blessed to live there. And suddenly, the last year and a half, I'm living in London, almost all of the time, and doing a lot of, of childminding. 
And so when my granddaughter was younger, and I used to be buggy pushing, you know, as you do when you've got young children, you know, you push buggies because that's how they go to sleep, up and down these concrete streets, you know, <laughs> up and down. And I could see in my mind, you know, I was beginning to shape, this is miserable, you know. Mm -hmm. It is really miserable. Same concrete streets day after day, you know, cars, noise. And I thought, do I have a choice here? <laughs> you know. I noticed trees and graveyards. Every street in London has got, almost every street's got trees. And they're all different, you know? And, and they're all kind of amazing. So pushing the buggy, being mindful, really appreciating the trees. Lovely. Isn't this lovely? I'm going for a lovely mindful walking period, appreciating trees. The shape of the world changing. Does it have to be an accident? Yeah. Does it have to be an accident that the shape of our world changes? Sometimes it seems we have no choices and the only choice we have is to choose what we have no choices about. Hmm? Rather than resistance or, or aversion or pushing away, to choose what we have no choices about. Hmm? You don't necessarily have choices if you become ill. I mean, you don't have choices about becoming ill, you know. You're ill. You ha do have choices. You can choose where you have no choice to be present in an intentional way and to change the patterns. To change the patterns. You know, I, I said to someone this morning, I'm, I'm living a life I didn't choose, and I have to choose it. Because if I don't choose it, I'm living a life of distress. And choosing it doesn't mean becoming passive, you know, and, and you know, being yeah, inert. It means choosing in, a, in an engaged way. This is my classroom. Yeah. You deliberately not using the word accept. I, I, well, I think ex I'm not using the word acceptance because I... Well, I think it carries a lot of baggage for some people. Yeah. There, there is the unacceptable also in life. So, you know, I would not promote accepting the unacceptable. So changing the shape of our world. You know, what does it need for us to change the shape of our world? It needs enough wakefulness. We need to be alert and tuned in to the symptoms or the signs of our world being shaped in unhelpful ways. We will be struggling, you know, if our world is being shaped by unhelpful patterns. You know, here, when we use this word sankata, not all sankaras or sankata are unwholesome or unskillful. You know, pretty much everything you do in practice is cultivating wholesome patterns. Mm. is cultivating wholesome patterns. The gain changes the shape of our mind. And when we change the shape of our mind, we change the shape of our world. Mm. There's something I think, you know, uh, uh, there's something I think that is so helpful about, you know, pausing many moments in a day and just asking ourselves, what is the shape of my mind? Because that will be the shape of our world. I think mindfulness, mindfulness is really the beginning um, of the ending of avidya or ignorance. That actually we really want to know. We really want to understand distress. We really want to, to see how our world is being shaped. And is it being shaped in a way that really liberates the heart? Or is it being shaped in a way that ties us to discontent and distress? And this is such a moment-to-moment a -moment investigation. I mean, you'd be so aware, aren't you, of how many moments in a day your, your, the shape of your world changes. You know, the shape of your world changes. And sometimes it feels very accidental. And I think here we're, we're actually endeavoring it to make it more intentional. Mm 